Thanks again for doing this. Um, I think a great um, a great topic to just begin with <clears throat> would be um, how you got into chemistry and what made you realize that was your love. I think we can bridge a lot of topics from that. So let's. I guess we could just jump right into into it with that. Um, I got into chemistry because I had no option to do anything else. <laughs> <laughs> actually well no it's not entirely true um i got my first chemistry set when i was i don't know eight years old and i got my first personal computer at the same time it was x81 mm -hmm. so i guess i wanted to join the two together i actually wanted to do mathematics or mathematics physics or computing or some combination of those but because i was in a uh i don't know i was in a school that didn't let me do the qualifications i needed because i was in the bottom of the class um by the time i convinced them I, the only real option to do science was to do chemistry. Got it. I knew, yeah, I knew it would be an interesting answer. I'm straightforward. Um, so did you, um, what aspect of chemistry did you kind of fall in love with in, in terms of its complexity or how it relates to the other sciences or, um, you know, that kind of thing? Um, I mean, I, when I started chemistry, um, because I'm, I suppose I did a lot of my own studying in math and computer science and physics when I was at school, you know, at spare time. And I was kind of under, I kind of had the foundation. I understood that I was just appalled yeah. by the fact that chemistry was so disconnected. There was no real rationale to anything. It was all a series of, I mean, obviously the periodic table it was, is a, was a great invention and, <laughs> yeah. It gives you some relationships, and obviously, the there are you can use approximations to solutions of the Schrodinger equation to understand how various elements will behave. But still, there's some weird stuff going on in the periodic table. So I found it bewildering, mm -hmm. appalling, and fascinating and exciting because um, I was just in incredibly confused. Okay, got it. And so that kind of bridges us to computation um, and how you're connecting computing to chemistry in a more broad manner. So um, why don't you give the audience a kind of intro to that and we can talk about that. Yeah, um, so I, like I said, I've always been wanting to connect computers to chemistry, not just to do simulations of chemical systems or necessarily to use chemical systems as computers, which is something we do do. Right. Um, chemistry is a very practical thing right it's about mixing stuff together and getting reactions and making new molecules and so i wondered if um and because i found chemistry so bewildering you know you'd mix these things together and this completely random thing would happen that you probably couldn't predict mm -hmm. uh, and i wondered if it was possible to to re make things more reproducible by um having a kind of in a way of making a kind of operating system for chemistry that would understand the unit operations of chemistry. And it's really simple. Like in chemistry, the main thing you do, add, heat, stir, mm. right? So to so have those operations kind of encoded in what we would call was like a state machine, which is a machine where, you know, you've got your reactor, which is empty. And then the first thing you do is add in your chemical, add in mm -hmm. so first, you know, first command, then add in second chemical, maybe, then add in two, stir, heat, watch for it to change color, then maybe cool down, add another something else, maybe another solvent to do an extraction mm -hmm. and all these things. So, so I realized over time that this programming language could be instantiated into a universal hardware. Right. Um, and universal hardware was actually very basic. It was just like a, a reactor, like a round bottom flask, or maybe most people will be familiar with a test tube. That's all equal, right? And yep. so the the computation i then kind of realized you know we made these things called computers which would you, you you put in this programming language put in the chemicals now become this molecule but i realized actually there's something more profound going on there that the process of making the molecule is compute is akin to computation computation it's not just a gimmick so what happened in computation i suppose the computation is you would say i'm going to take some pieces of data say let's say two plus let's say two, the, the integer two and the integer three and then uh, the computation i'm going to add i'll add i'll add two to three and then if i and i get five now if i do that in the calculator the hardware 
and the algorithm, put in the data, get out the number. Do it on any calculator, I should still get five. Two plus three is five, right? So that's computation, uh, mathematical computation. And I wondered if I could have the same thing where I could have chemical A, chemical B, hardware, add the program, new chemical out, or the product out. And that process of going from your input chemicals to your output chemicals is computation. And the same way going from your input numbers, two and three, to your output number five is computation. And I realized there was something deep there because the rules of computation and the rules of computation are basically similar in terms of um, simulation and understanding and building languages and and kind of the whole the whole you know seventy years of computation can be applied to computation and that's kind of where it started. Right, and it's it's kind of a wild thing in the first place that each molecule is in a little algorithm, and if you add another molecule to it or, or do something, it it has a definite um, reaction that's going to happen every time. And philosophically, do you think about that how the universe set that up while you while you think about this it's very well I, I would say what i try and do is say the, mo the molecule doesn't really have an algorithm associated with it it's a bit like a number when you add a number they don't have an algorithm you add the algorithm in this case addition so in this case actually although the molecule does have some intrinsic properties like you know number three has a property which is different to number two in terms of whether you define three as prime or not yeah. um, the molecules have an intrinsic reactivity the way you get them to work together algorithmically is you force them into a state where they will react. So most chemicals, you might have to heat it up. Or if the reaction is violent, you might need to cool it down. Or you might need to add a catalyst. Mm -hmm. So what, I, what, the, what the chemical programming language does, it allows you to add what we call the process variables, which are kind of the equivalent of the algorithm that you have in computation to kind of force the molecules to do what you want. But I think you're right. Philosophically, the fact there's information in the molecules and right. molecules can do all these things is super interesting um, and, and quite profound. Right. And it's like if you take sulfur or if you take a certain element and you add it with an element, element it's going to do something. And, I, and the fact that that even exists, that, that interaction is predetermined and the universe wants it to do it that way is just... Uh, oh. The the other side of that is just nothing happens or it's chaotic or chaos theory applied to everything and that's not quite well, you know well I think that's really so the point you're making here is kind of interesting so so I guess if you go back to periodic table the periodic table kind of gives you the basic reactivity of all the elements let's say every element has that reactivity which is which is ultimately controlled by you can analyze it uh, and calculate with the with quantum mechanics solve the Schrodinger equation. And you know, for instance, like how many bonds would carbon have typically? So bond carbon can typically have to between two and four bonds um, with, other, with, other, uh, with other atoms. So you, you can calculate that. So that's kind of the first rule at the top of the tree. Sure. And so the next rule is then say, well, if carbon can have up to four bonds sure. and oxygen can have up to two bonds and hydrogen typically only has one bond, how do you com com combine those together? So it becomes a combinatorial um, molecular math problem, if you like. So you then have to control that. And one of the things I've realized is actually that chemical reactions, well, I can view, I can view the process of doing a chemical reaction a bit like, a, or the space of chemical reactions like an oracle in a computation. So what, what is an oracle in a computation? Well, an oracle is a kind of a database of all the answers right. to your question. And you go to the oracle and say, here's my question, and it gives you an answer. In chemistry, what I'm trying to get people to think of is to think that actually all, all chemical, re chemi chemical reactions aren't that special. They're not that intrinsic other than controlled by quantum mechanics, the intrinsic reactivity. But actually, most chemical reactions exist like in an oracle. And the way you call out the chemical reactions in the oracle is you say, right, I'm going to put these, these, this catalyst and this amount of process control, like temperature or whatever, in, can I get this out? And looking at chemical reactions like they're all accessible in this database is kind of exciting because it allows you then to say, well, it's not just chaos in the universe. You've got the intrinsic reactivity from periodic table and those rules. Mm -hmm. Then you've got other rules you add on to them. And those rules, where do they come from? Well, they come from evolution and humanity, and they're built on Earth, right? So the chemical reactions on Earth are probably very different to the chemical reactions on Venus or on Celsius or on other planets because of the contingency that, you know, not everything that could happen does happen, 
but a lot of stuff does happen. Mm -hmm. the, yes, to me, the universe could easily have been born and one corner does something totally different and the other corner does something else different, but it's just uniform throughout, which is very interesting. And the processes when things interact is uniform as well, which we'll talk about because I want to talk about aliens eventually and um, and, and that stuff and uniformity goes in, into my theory there. But um, okay, so we're bridging now to life. Life is complex chemistry. You talked about this with Lex, and while I, while I was watching that, I was just I was saying I hope you guys talked about it, but you didn't. And what I want to talk about is is um, the fact that life even has the is is an agent that has an incentive. It's it's the first thing. It's the first part of chemistry that has an incentive to do something, and and that's even more miraculous than the fact that molecules have algorithms in them to interact in that uniformity that I just mentioned. So how are you how are you bridging or trying to bridge computation or computation? Sorry, with with how we the origins of life, which you have a focus on, or at least did. Yeah, no, we are. I mean, the, the reason I built the technology of computation was actually to build a okay. literally a search engine yeah, yeah. that would search chemical space for the pathway to life. I see. Um, and and um, and I when I first of all asked for funding, and I went to people and I wrote grants on origin of life. Yep. Um, projects, you know, tens of millions of dollars for origin of life work. Everyone just said, no, we're not interested. Okay. And I said, okay, yeah. drug discovery and making molecules with <laughs> right. robots went fine. Um, <clears throat> and it's fortunate that technology can be used, you know, in the same in the same way, it, it, to do the same way. It's just in reverse. Whereas computation of a target, you're trying to get to a target molecule, computation for exploring a chemical space, you don't know what your target is, but you have yeah. some process control. Right. But the, the emergence of life from chemistry is a very deep problem. And it's it's kind of interesting because if you're a biologist, you kind of intrinsically have a feel what life is. Right. If you're a chemist, you're kind of like decomposing biology into chemistry and working out how does that become alive. And you're a physicist. Typically, although you're alive as an observer and you accept that there is life in the universe, the laws of physics do not explain life and and that that is a real the interesting problem so that means probably understanding the phenomena of becoming alive mm -hmm. is something that needs to be to, to start with physics and end up with whatever biology you achieve and that and obviously chemistry seems to be on earth at least the the medium through which life expresses itself because chemical bonds and complex molecules and cells and ribosomes and things are needed for the cell to go through this evolutionary process. But it's really profoundly hard because it's not beyond the chemist to solve the problem, I don't think, but it's probably beyond the chemist. The chemist should not be working on their own. They should be working cross-discipline with lots of different teams, lots of different areas to say, first of all, what is life? What is the phenomena? And we can't even decide on that. No, and, that, and that's a and that's a that's a very big right existential problem. We, we have this blanket term complex chemistry, and that's the closest we can get. And I would like in my lifetime to get closer and understand how this this happens. Do you think life um, needed to happen on Earth at that time? Uh, we'll we'll call it um, four billion. Well, it did happen. Um, does life need? I mean, I think life is a is as uh, as common in the universe as the formation of stars. Maybe, maybe not exactly the same. Does every star have a life form around it? Well, so we're on the same page there, then. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Right. It's a, it's like you know that the, there is a. The, I think we don't really understand yet the force that gives rise to life. I mean, I think my group and some collaborators in Arizona State University and a few others mm -hmm. at Santa Fe Institute, we're very close to kind of understanding at least the beginning steps of what that, that um, driving force is. And it's everywhere in the universe. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah. And, and I'll go back to what I've said in my past videos. Um, you have the, all, the size of the universe, which is insanely large, right? It's almost infinite. You have the uniformity of the elements. It's the same thing throughout. And then you have time. And we have the sample size of one with the Earth, four billion years, life. If we just plug everything in, life life has to be everywhere, right? And, and until someone on my one of these episodes tells me, wait, no, you're not thinking of X, I'm just gonna go with it. I don't I don't see like I don't see anything else, you know. So I, well, I, I would say there's 
not life that's our complex and there's life way more complex and there's a whole scale that we should probably think about. I think from a philosophical or from an epistemic point of view, that's pretty, that's a hard thing to take. I don't see, I, I would, so I believe, so I believe there's life around every sun and that's what you're saying. Yeah. And I think you're saying there's no reason not to believe that that's fine. Right, right. I think what is, what is um, more difficult is the fact that we, my feeling is that life on any planet is very contingent of what happened to the planet. So there might be our planets out there where life almost got going, but didn't quite make it, but something interesting happened. And yeah. where life made it and then went over the other side, maybe the planet just, it, you know, got... Um, well, that's where my it. element of, of size comes in. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, but I, what I'm trying to say is I think that the there it's a, it takes a leap of... A, a lots of For me, it's not a leap of imagination, and evidently for you, that, that life is everywhere. But a lot of biochemists and a lot of chemists are pretty, pretty confused and would say that yeah. life doesn't exist anywhere. And I think, you know, I don't know who was it said that um, it was a famous person who said it might have been Feynman. It might. No, it might have been um, actually. Carl uh, um, 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 Sagan, who said, you know, the oh. universe is either full of life or got no life in it. Both. Mm-hmm. options are terrifying <laughs> right right yeah <laughs> excuse me so <laughs> so i think that's a yeah i agree with you though i don't see any i don't see any magic on earth that right. precludes light chemistry formed everywhere anywhere else right. i think we should be very careful where we with the zone we look you right. know it's probably hard for life to form on mercury because it's so close to the sun sure. it's probably life not difficult for life to form Say on one of the planets in the outer cell, Neptune, because it's so cold. Yeah. And what? But what about in the the gaps in the middle? Right. We need to. Yeah. And, and with James Webb, we're going to be able to look at these Goldilocks areas, which is great. Um, and hopefully, we can find something. And, and you can work more with those people to kind of parallel chemistry and, and what we should look for with how they're you know their observations, which you can't do, right? You don't have that those instruments. So that's exciting. Yeah, I mean, I just want to make a life form in the lab, right? And I really want to basically get this get this technology to a stage where I can do it. Let's talk about that. How how, um, how organic do you want this process to be? Because at the end of the day, you're, we're life making life. So are we really making organic life? So um, I, I don't. So in the first instance, um, let's let's go all the way to what's been done. So I, if I did a Craig Venter, which was amazing, where he facsimile the genome made the genome in a in a lab in a chemistry lab or in a in a in this dna synthesis lab yeah. then um took um the minimal cell so he had to take an actual native cell produced by biology where the innards taken out pretty much that so all the genome removed put in a new genome and then it started so mm-hmm. that's pretty that's quite cheating because if you put the genome into an artificial cell that you've made in lab it wouldn't work yeah so what that says is there's something about natural cells that have some non-genetic information required for life to work, which is crazy and very interesting. So that now let's go down the level and say, right, I will try and make a life form in my lab, but I'll use it, I'll use DNA and proteins to just keep mixing and trying, mixing and trying. And I could get successful there. And if I'm successful, that's a big deal. And people will say, that's great, but I wouldn't be satisfied because I'm using existing evolutionary machinery and I wouldn't know to what degree. Right. Um, that I'm just, uh, I, you know, I, the, the key steps required for this machinery to emerge, right. I just copied. Then we go down the level like you and just say, you were suggesting like we just use organic chemistry and make a life form anyway. Mm-hmm. And if we're able to make a life form um, that is very different to current biology, that would be very exciting. Right. But the trick would be to say, how did we make it? If we could do it in a reaction system that had minimal intervention. It was, all, in fact, literally like a model of planet Earth 4.5 billion years ago, then probably that would be r- amazing. If you could make a model Earth and run it forward a few million years mm-hmm. and watch life emerge, mm-hmm. that would be absolutely fantastic. Okay. How are you defining... How are you? So, so is this is this the top thing you and your team are working on? Would you say? Uh, lots of top things, but one of them. Lots of top. Things. How are you defining 
what goals do you guys have? I'm very curious with these experience. Like, um, I guess at the moment, because they probably change, but like, how are you defining life? And then what goals are you giving the team? Yeah, so the definition of life at the moment we're using is where uh, the so you put simple molecules into the into the reactor, okay. and and what you want to happen with little um, orchestration or control, those molecules should somehow undergo selection and get more complex. And um, we've made a detection system for that. Oh my, okay. So that's so. This is real. This is like real stuff. Okay. Oh yeah, it's ha- it's happening right now in the lab. There are reactions going on where people are. Ba- we're basically going through this combinatorial space, and we're looking for evidence of emergence of complexity. Mm-hmm. And once we start to see that convincingly, and we actually ha- well, we actually have seen it fairly convincingly. We okay. say, what is the mechanism? Because it's you know, life life is not magic. It may feel like magic to be alive, actually. Um, but it's not the the there. Is, I don't see any need for any unknown physical principle, mm-hmm. or despite the fact that, or there is one physical principle we need that doesn't exist in physics that we have to put into the universe for life. But we can talk about that later. Okay, got it. Um, I see. So okay. So and then, what constitutes complexity? So you're getting these measurements. Um, what exactly are you seeing that's so complex that's getting you in the right steps? Yeah, so think about this like, um, um, I guess in a way, if you've got some Lego bricks, yep. right? And you put your Lego bricks in your reactor. And it, well, the way I, I mean, the, the simulate, the kind of analogy would be Lego bricks in the box, just pick them up blindly or put them in a washing machine to keep them around so you start to accrete. And you allow yourself to get, I don't know, a Lego model with 100 Lego blocks in it. And you look at the Lego model. Mm-hmm. And then when you look at the Lego model, you can say, right, is there any, uh, first of all, I, it's important that when I'm making my Lego model randomly, I don't just find one example. I look for um, the the machine which spits out my Lego models right. must spit, spit out identical models, right? So I must find more than one because if I only find one Lego model in my drum, it's a random, it's equivalent to a random event. So it's just like just random event. However, if in my drum I get a Lego model come out, let's, let's say, I don't know, Lego Harry Potter castle comes out of this infinite Lego drum, I get one. Yep. And then a few minutes later, I get another one. Right, that trend. And I get and the other two, I'm like, two. oh my God, there's a planning process here. Someone is building Lego, you know, Harry Potter Lego castles. Right. Now, if there is no one building it and I'm not a creationist, I'll say, okay, what is the mechanism that's producing this? Right. But let me ask you a question about how you detect it. So the way we detect these Lego Harry Potter castles um, in chemistry, well, they're the equivalent of really of complex molecules. Well, we use some chemical analysis techniques, which are very good at counting the number of different parts a molecule has. So it's a yeah. bit like you looking at the Harry Potter castle and saying, well, how much symmetry does it have? How much information do I need to reproduce it? Oh, it's quite unsymmetrical, quite kind of weird looking. It's gothic, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Same with a molecule. So let's go to molecule space. Forget Harry Potter now. Mm-hmm. If you've got this molecule, and when you cut the molecule up, you can cut it up into pieces, different pieces, and the st- number of steps it takes to make that molecule on the shortest path is great, is large, and say typically more than 15, we think that those molecules can only be produced by life. So what does that mean? That means if I take some random molecules from somewhere in the universe, I put them in my, my, my mass spectrometer, and I hit them with energy, and I s- count the parts, and I get more than 15 different parts. Mm-hmm. That molecule has been produced by a living system. Okay. That's the thesis. So that's like a, a life form detector, measurer, and quantifier, if you like, all together, and w- without having to have a definition that's completely cumbersome and weird, and you know, you need replication, and you need proteins, and you need blah, 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 blah. You're like, no. Is a molecule complex? Is a molecule detectable in a large abundance, many copy numbers? Is it highly assembled? If it's highly assembled and and in a high copy number, then it can't be a random chance. A process that's evolutionary must have made it. Job done. Found life. Right, and then Nobel. Yeah, everything after that. (laughs) So you, so you're gonna, you must start every week. You probably, yeah, you probably have the most rewarding and interesting job in the world. You know, I mean, I don't see. 
can't see anything else. <laughs> if you <laughs> start every week, just under, just not like thinking, am I going to figure out how life was graded this week? Like that is exciting. And then I think you're, you're bringing up, you're transitioning us into assembly theory. So I'd love to talk about that and, and how you view assembly theory in general and with life and then the universe just in general too. Well, assembly theory was kind of the, the, the premise for assembly theory where I started to kind of, it's kind of interesting because, you know, I, I, assembly theory came out of an experiment when I was thinking about are molecules intrinsically complex and computational people were being like labeling them as complex, but making it very complex by, you know, looking up the uh, atom type and assigning an information quantity, then looking at the coordinates and all this. But what you had to do is the observer had to look at the molecule, write down the, the structure and and then decide whether it's complex or not, a kind of algorithmic complexity measure. And those measures need an observer. So I was like, is there a way I can do this without having to be an observer, right? And the detect the, the detect is more compact. So assembly theory, when I I imagine the mass spec experiment where I take a molecule in the mass spec mm -hmm. and I hit it with some energy and it decom it, it decomposes in steps, like first bit, the next bit, the next bit, all the way, like cutting like cuts of a piece of cheese or a banana until there's no bits to cut. Right. And you look at how many bits you've got. And then I was like, oh, I can now put these in order in sequence of cuts I made. How do that? I make the first cut, the second cut, and when I put them in order, I can then get the shortest path, and I can then work out, you know, um, how complex the molecule is. And that was the basis for assembly theory um, in in molecular space. Yeah. And we've, you know, we've done a lot to validate that. Um, but what's really exciting is it appears that assembly theory, the the the, the way we're doing it just now, isn't just about measuring aliveness. There is a quantity that we are calling assembly, which tells us about, I used to call it causation. Mm -hmm. The causation is very triggering for physicists and, and mathematicians and so on and computer scientists. So I call it contingent. And that's a nice word, contingent, because you can say, look, how much contingency is there in this molecule? It's a bit like saying, let's say, I don't know if you do any art or compose music, and let's say you just spend two seconds composing some music, so you only write a couple of notes. Mm -hmm. That music isn't very contingent. But say you write an entire, I don't know, five minute, five point five minute, thirty three second Bohemian Rhapsody. That's pretty contingent. <laughs> and so um, we can measure contingency in the universe using this method. And so it, it looks like assembly theory, although we, we it was born in a molecular experiment, yeah. um, it applies to everything. And okay, it applies to everything. That was that was my next bridge. Yeah. So it, it replaces yeah. entropy. <laughs> right right sure what else does it apply to that excites you um i mean it explains all the complexity in the universe right because all the complexity in the universe comes from contingency and selection occurs in the universe without evolution you have selection before evolution selection can occur you get some complexity not a lot mm -hmm. but then when when the universe invent, invents life right. evolution open and evolution starts you form life forms those life forms then also typically if they become conscious, intelligent, and whatnot, and have abstractions, they can make technologies, they can make languages, they have a culture, they have memes. Right. And you can and the thing is, we think that the objects we have in our reality, like the books on my bookshelf, you know, the remote control I have here, these objects are separate to life, but they are not. They are on the lineage of life. No origin of life, no remote control. Yeah. Remote control is completely connected to the origin of life. Sure. Um, these objects and this object is literally took three point seven or whatever billion years to build because to build this object you needed to go dead planet origin of life luca bacterial right. cells a couple of billion years of bacteria photosynthesis right. Right. all the way up animal you know you know fish animals blah, 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 mammals technology computer yeah. revolution right. music remote control <laughs> yeah right that's interesting way to think about things um Okay, so I guess the next question off that is um, evolution. So I, I spend a lot of time thinking about evolution and why life, again, even has that incentive as an agent um, to propagate. Because if you think about a rock on the moon, it's just going to be a rock on the moon until um, something with Newton's law makes it not a rock on the moon. Um, but and it doesn't have an incentive. It doesn't have an incentive, but life for some reason has something built into it where it wants to propagate and evolution makes 
makes that apparent. Um, and so I, I always think about this exp uh, this thought experiment that I made up in my head with with um, evolution. I'd love to get your take on it. Um, and it just illustrates that we're missing something, I think, because we have mutations that um, give life forms the ability to almost um, have something new, a polar bear becoming white. Oh, wow, it's in a snowy environment. Let's have more polar bears be white or bears be white, whatever. But my, my thought experiment is, is if we take a, a, f a forest, for example, we'll just call it a thousand acre forest, and we'll just say that it, it's um, a green forest with brown and green shades, and that's it. And you have standard deer, standard, we'll call the predator a mountain lion. Um, if you if you paint that forest, or if you flip a switch, and that forest now becomes like um, neon purple, for example, in a million years, or that's maybe that's too long. That's way too long. <laughs> we'll we'll call it fifty thousand years. I we can probably guarantee that those deer are going to be neon purple, right? And maybe the predator is going to be neon purple, or and they're going to start adapting. But we don't see any neon purple deer today, and the, those mutations don't happen. So there's this weird thing with life that where it, it needs to do something. It needs to go. And it needs to propagate, and it needs to adapt and be better. And like I said, it's the only thing um in the universe that does that so mm -hmm. what do you think about that and, and what do you think about that experiment so okay so it's it's come becoming clear to me over the years that that full experiment getting that right is as hard as inventing uncertainty principle and non-locality in quantum mechanics right because we we are not equipped to imagine these things they are really quite unphysical for us so let me explain how I think the best way to look about look at it is sure rocks don't do very much they're pers they're persistent but they don't they're, they're not I don't know they they don't exist they're not existent right and I'm just going to make these two words so persistent is like something that it persists over time but there's no dynamics okay now if you've got system so the there is no erasure process it's hard to break up the rock it's high energy process if you have material and the bonds are lower energy and you can break them up, then over time you get decay and there's no existence. And it just things just don't exist. So now let's think about this. There's eons of time. Let's just unfold. Mm -hmm. Unstable objects, rocks. Let's have the rock as a control. The rock is still there. It was always there. Four billion years, always there. But you've got this other mass where it's decaying away. And, it, and let's just... Let's assume we've got the origin of life now. So let's just look at evolution. So you've got some objects up that are pop, that are evolving, and the way they're doing it is they are producing offspring, mm -hmm. and by random mutation, those offspring have differences in their their phenotype, mm -hmm. and they will just be randomly killed in the environment, just okay. dead. And then some of them are like got an advantage, right. and they can able to run faster, to catch more prey, or to hide. And because they are able to exist, mm -hmm. the that that mutation is selected for. So this continued pre um, dance between existence and dynamics and searching it means that you can search quite a wide space. So then, if you've got your neon covered landscape and your your non neon thing, mm -hmm. it's going to get eaten. And so, but over time, all the different colors are going to get tried. And if neon is in the repertoire. As soon as you hit neon, you get this advantage. So the whole, the meaning does not exist in the future of the universe. Meaning is only something that you can project backwards. Same with goals. They exist in the past because only once you exist, you went, oh, I did this. But it was a random process. And the fact you still exist and you exist to then procreate, and that is good, is why it feels so unworldly and amazing to us. But it, all it is is our ability to exist dynamically with respect to the boring rock, which is non-dynamic and just being a boring rock, maybe undergoing radioactive decay. Right. And now that's a that's just the start of the explanation. It will get deeper over time. Um, my colleague Sarah Walker and myself are using assembly theory to explore that, and some teams, some group at Santa Fe, mm -hmm. look at selection. And I and I think we're getting closer to this conceptual bottleneck where we just find it so hard to understand how purpose and goals and meaning and right. intention and all these funny teleological words emerge 
in a living system. Right. And and I think selection and existence, and at the end of the day, the only thing that really we universe really cares about is whether you exist or not. Because if you don't exist, you're not affecting anything in the universe. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. It all goes down to information at the end of the day and what's if you're your information or you're not information. And well, I, yeah, I, I I think the information thing is I find it find it hard because the information doesn't exist in a vacuum exists in a substrate but i know what you mean you could give me some information now and i could write it down you could tell me the lottery numbers right and they may not be right and and so the fact that we share an abstraction yeah. means that uh, the, the what i'm trying to say is information is only information for us because we are in assembly theory we are we share a common past some mm -hmm. so, someone in our past taught right. us english or right. taught the like in the like, you know, and that language is propagated right. up, and we're like, oh, now we can communicate because we share past, share yeah. culture, and so, so immediately, the fact you can transfer me information yeah. is because we have we we come from the same lineage of life. Right. Yeah. And with your information example, it's a good way to look at it. Is just take a blank piece of paper, you write down anything. You can maybe erase things. That's time, obviously. And then whatever's on that piece of paper, there you write down cup, you write down keyboard, you write down Apple. Um, those are the only things that exist in the universe, and that's what I was getting at. And then the information paradox is crazy too, and that's why I just I'm so into information because what Hawking found and all that stuff. Um, cool. And then so um, let's. Let's go to the new topic, I guess. We can talk about UFOs um, because it's a hot topic and the viewers will exc be excited by it. I'm pretty boring when it comes to UFOs, I, I don't think. Uh, you know. if, if I, personally, I think um, when we can connect this to what we think about life and how close it might be, but I, I think UFOs are generally, um, if there is something, it's simply just another life form bringing um some measuring device over to catalog the planets of the galaxy um most likely we've we have some interesting technology that the government is trying to hide i think that's probably it or it's just fake videos i don't know so yeah i i, I personally i don't think if an alien does have the capability to make an instrument to get here they don't need to physically be in the ship that's how i look at it um so I'm, yeah of course curious to hear what you think about that and then life in general maybe close by I mean, the whole UFO thing I find uh, fascinating. I'm, I'm not, I haven't really, I, I, re I haven't really paid much attention to all the, all the, you know, the fight, the, the findings and so on and looked at the data. And, uh, um, well, but I is, guess there, is it even right? data? <laughs> I was going to say, is it even data, you know? There's, well, the US Navy have released some data and there's lots of, uh, you know, eyewitness te testimonies. So there's a cultural phenomenon, there's a mythos associated with them. Yeah. I think that um, it's, um, there, there certainly are. There, is it possible that we could be visited by aliens? Sure. Is it possible mm -hmm. that they can get here really quickly and through mechanisms we don't know? Sure. Definitely. But we don't. But that would be real, really news to us physics-wise. So I think what's really interesting is it, what might be much more possible is there might be aliens visiting us, right, or nearby us from our own solar system, but they are so different to us they share a different lineage we won't even notice them and i think that it's it's very unlikely that we're going to find uh, we're going to find aliens easily because of the this until we start redefining what life is right and, and so um what do i think of usos well i think it's interesting that there is excitement now and there are people that that, that are adamant there are yeah. these anomalies that yeah. are worthy of attention and they believe the us air force and us navy in particular have overwhelming evidence that there is something going on mm -hmm. i haven't seen that evidence um and i wonder why the pentagon was saying all this stuff maybe they were just like looking for a budget increase or yeah i i think i i mean if we do have certain technology that can that's much better than combustion engines etc what better who better to test it on than the best air force and navy in the world which is us right ourselves and so you would get that you would get those measurements and those videos from from our own pilots and of course the top of the top only know about it and then so that that's that's i would guess it's that you know which is fine which is exciting in itself we have these made possible um if the videos are real possible um advances in physics um but yeah i just i don't think um they would need to even come here physically and if, if they do it, it's going to 100 be totally invisible they don't need to 
show us they they're here and then they can make their measurements probably even from afar. And I do I do think though a civilization there's there's a real big debate going on with intellectuals and, and podcasters or whatever that just like are they interested in us are they not interested in us and I, I would say yes they are interested in us because i would want to catalog the universe i would want to have a giant cart map of everybody that lives everywhere and and what everything's made of and so that's interesting i think but other than that i don't think they need to abduct people and check out what we're doing no i no i agree that that's an interesting you know i, I don't i don't know what the origin story are for those for right. those things but I do, I do think you know it. It would be a, an encounter. The most preferable encounter of alien life probably is a, a one with a ba- alien bacteria that, yeah. um, that that basically has got different biochemistry. That would be fascinating. That would be show that there is the, the solution for life is um, yeah. different and, un- and life is universal. Um, I, I guess the most boring encounter of alien life would if we found like just normal human. <laughs> Sorry, Earth, Earth life based on Mars because we contaminated it or it grew there, and I guess the most terrifying one would be to meet sentient aliens, you know, and uh, we'd want to know very quickly if they're friend or foe, yeah. um, and I would want to know because I think you know how do they see the world? Uh, wh- wh- how do they process information? How long do they live? Do they have a political system? Do they discover capitalism? Um, you know, what is their science like? I mean, how, what is their chemistry like? All these things. I'd love to know them. You know, I'd have, it would be an absolutely uh, a game changer for the human race forevermore. Yeah. Aliens. I mean, we can't understate how no. profound that event is going to be. It would be, yeah, it would be insane. Every religion would be upended, not in a bad way, not in a good way. It would just be like everything would be, the, the world would focus on it so much but within the context of who you are as a person so like messiah type stuff would be thrown around and it would be um very interesting and i would hope that well right now china is going to be the one to 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 get the radio signals not us so that's interesting to think about or us you're not yeah you're not an american but you know what i mean so um that's sad but um, yeah, th- there's definitely, uh, definitely. Would you say that the Mars life or um, Titan life or Enceladus life, um, even if it's single-celled organisms, would be um, the most likely in our lifetime? Um, I would, in our lifetime, yeah, I would probably bet that we will find evidence of life on Mars. I'm not so sure about Enceladus. I'd like to look on Venus. The problem is the outer solar system is very tempting. Mm -hmm. And also it's very exciting because if we do find life in the outer solar system, it's almost certainly going to be different to Earth life because the chances of exchange will be very low and um, we'll have an an option to see how different it is. I just don't know how, you know, it's so expensive to get to the outer outer solar system and to land Mm -hmm. um, and and get stuff back. So it would be good to to know, you know, well, yeah, I mean, the other thing is it might be that we're able to make life in the lab and then we can pinpoint roughly what the earth conditions are like for that. And, we, and, then, we, and then and then just use a James Webb and just point at the regions and yeah. just scan the sky and see if we can find any further evidence of life by by really looking at these exoplanets carefully, if we can find them. That's a good. That's a good point. Find the formulas first, and and point, and just look. And I talked to Slava Tursiev from NASA. He's working on a um, gravitational telescope using stars, um, which is interesting. And he and he he plans to do the same thing or help with that. So that's, yeah. I mean, if we can if we can get people like you make the formulas and then send send get get that information, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, and so you you mentioned you said a word that I want to dive into, and you said sentience. Um, how do you define that? And then if we want to go into consciousness as well, that's cool. I I have a pretty interesting take on consciousness um, that we can go over, but I would I'd love to hear, like, you know, how do you define sentient and what, what do you think that even means? Is a life that you create in the lab going to be sentient? I mean, it could, it could be, but it won't be to start with. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I'm not a panpsychist, but I think panpsychist has got things the wrong way around. Um, but um, I'm willing, to, I need to talk to, one of its main kind of advocates, Philip Goff, um, and uh, and just try and dig down a bit rather than be too dismissal because he likes to think of fractions of consciousness. But I, 
I just, I'm a materialist. I don't know everything about the material world, but the way I think it looks like is that um, in the same way that life isn't a thing, I don't really think it's not an on-off switch. I don't think consciousness is an on-off switch. Um, and what you want is you obviously got origin of life. You've got cells. The cells specialize more and more and more. You make, you make multicellular organisms. You get to, you know, complex life animals. Right. And an animal has a brain. And the, 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 the need for a brain is important when you're out of the water because suddenly you can see far, right? And then you, can, you have to, you can then, if you see, can see far, you've got time to plan. Now, if you've got time to plan, you need to have some space in your brain, right? You need to be able to start to abstract and 3D and imagine. And really, the, the, the consciousness, if you like, is, is required because you're able to see in the present, remember the past, and imagine the future. And evolutionarily, those things were selected for, right? So you can imagine, you can now imagine, sorry, remember what happened to you last week when you almost fell off, you know, a cliff or something. And you're like, oh, I can remember that. And I'm at a cliff again. And, I'm, and I could imagine walking over and falling off and dying. And I don't want to do that. So I won't do that. I just imagined it. So thanks, don't do that. So consciousness is this, this um, has to be active, right, in your brain. It's not something that happened, you know, without some, a kind of active processing uh, or whatever we call it whether it's in your subconscious brain where i guess where active processing occurs and your conscious brain just literally reads out what your subconscious brain has done so so i think that there's a lot of sentience around animals are sentient anything with a brain is probably sentient um okay and you can measure it but then if you like then there's these additional quality that human can and some birds have which is abstraction because right. you can get some birds to count so now, so that's there's these levels of consciousness, right? There's the one where you're just conscious like a cat. And what? you're like, I'm pretty sure cats don't abstract. Mm -hmm. Dogs might, mm -hmm. right? Because dogs, they seem to have their name, and name's quite an abstract, you know, abstraction. And then you go up and up and up. And then the, uh, the, 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 the really the highest sentience, I guess, the human beings that can abstract. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So the confusion, not by you, just by the, everybody around sentience and consciousness i just i think i don't even think consciousness even as a word should exist i don't even know what that means and there's a lot of confusion around it what i think is there's chemistry that's not complex and then there's complex chemistry which is what we're defining as life and then if we dive we zoom into life there's a scale and in that scale there's what we call again we don't even know what this is intelligence and that's where we should stop i don't know what it means to say that my cat or my dog or myself are conscious, um, not the awake type, just the consciousness on a more philosophical. The self-referencing. The thing that's one point is really is self-referencing, right? So the difference between the cat and the dog is a bit like some babies when they get up and you you put when you basically put a baby in front of a mirror and you put its you know finger on its nose, or you, sorry, you go to you 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 basically. Um, they, they they try to touch the nose in the mirror because they don't know it's them, and it's so so when you're able to know that you are a self, there is something special that happens. There are plenty animal plenty of animals that don't know they're a self. Okay. If a cat cat looks in the mirror, it just sees another cat. Okay, so you're saying consciousness can be defined by a point on that scale that I. That I just outlined, and that's where okay, everything after that is is conscious. Okay. Yeah, and I wouldn't even. I mean, I'm with you. I think consciousness is a difficult word, but I've shifted my view in the years to say that consciousness does exist, just from the point of view of self agency and decision making yeah. and active decision making. Because of course, a cat makes a decision, but his decisions are much less right. um, imaginatory. Mm -hmm. They are responded to or like making it, they're responding to events, whereas you will respond to events, but your response will be much more complex mm -hmm. because you have a memory and you have an imagination. And although selection is driving it, there's a huge overhead you've got in this imagination in your consciousness that allows you to do the counterfactuals. Do I go to this movie? Do I go to that store? Do I decide to have Korean for dinner or, you know, whatever. Like there's lots of different things that are playing out. Still all select selections in control. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that, that there is free will. <laughs> I think the selection is in control of everything. But, mm -hmm. uh, but you do have the ability to kind of very high level make abstractions. 
and whether you can just call it abstraction ability or consciousness, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about free will after I do this. I want to throw a wrench in this. <clears throat> so now let's look at Andromeda, and we find a life form that is um, a billion years older than us. How, are, are they? Are we conscious compared to those to those life forms? Um, I I don't I don't know. I mean, the thing is, um, it's I don't think it's reasonable to even ask the question about consciousness right. for aliens yet because. We, I think that I don't know. I mean, I think that consciousness is universal. So I think the aliens will have an abstraction. They'll build machines and so on. And mm-hmm. and there's no doubt. If you need to have a language, you need to have some of that. Um, so so I don't know if you know there might be alien cats out there that don't know that they look in the mirror. Right. Um, but I, but I I think uh, if you were to push me, I would say that probably abstraction is probably is done by aliens. Anything that builds machines needs to abstract. Um, and so if the alien had actually been out of travel anywhere, they must have had some degree of competence and consciousness and abstraction and tool building and problem yeah. solving and therefore intelligence. I, I don't think it's correct to associate intelligence with biochemical processes on their own. There's something else that happens that we don't understand yet. I guess, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is, is we can map out the life, um, the life scale from an ant to us, and we would not say ants are conscious. But if we look at that Andromeda species, we can probably say 10 times the scale between the ant and us, between those two. And are we going to still say consciousness? That's, so that's like, yeah, it was, it was devil's advocate, but that's it's an interesting thing. Well, the cool thing is you can actually use assembly theory to measure consciousness as well. Okay. So the way to do it is this. Uh, it's characteristic assembly number. So basically, physical things, phys- physics without a memory just makes things with low assembly. Mm-hmm. Molecules that are, say, two or three, four, maybe up to 10 or 11. Yeah. Borderline between complex chemistry and, and biology is between 12 to 15. Mm-hmm. And what human beings can do is they can do chemistry. Or, the, you know, and the, the human being, the organic chemist, can design molecules that are more complex than biology can produce. Mm-hmm. They can put atoms where they want. So think of like molecular artwork. So there are some molecules out there that have a like an assembly index in the hundreds. Yep. And that's because a human being built it, a conscious human being. Think of like a piece of artwork. Some art, the artwork, because uh, as long as you've got that the artist has some reasonable copies, right? And if there's more than a few copies, and uh, I mean like a I don't know, Jeff Kuhn or something, um, then um, you can be sure that, that that art, if you like, of uh, the assembly index is high. Is mm-hmm. produced by conscious entity. So you have like a scale. Mm-hmm. And I think this is the problem what IIT had, integrated information theory, because everything was conscious in IIT because of the way they were integrating information. What assembly theory does is show you've got lineages of information and how that propagates mm-hmm. and how you need to look for evidence of abstraction and consciousness, not to try and assess how conscious you or I are. So I I would right. say consciousness by the most creative thing you've done. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, I'll have to marinate on that after we, we talk. Uh, so free will. Um, I ha- Maybe we disagree with this so we can argue. Um, is free will. So for me, free will is just. I don't even know what that means either. I don't think that exists. I, I, to me, to me, everything is predetermined, not by some crazy divine presence, but just things are going to, there's one, there's one iteration of the universe and it's going to happen no matter what I do. If I right now stop this call, ran into the street and just started to fly away or something or not fly away, but um, did something crazy. I still made that. I still made that decision. I mean, and that was predetermined, right? It's all going to, it's just, it's evolution. Something's going to happen to the earth. Like you said, the sun's going to expand and we're all going to hopefully not die. And uh, that's all going to happen. So I don't, I don't even know really when people debate about free will, um, what they mean, but that's how I look at it. And I know you had an interesting conversation with Lex about that. So I, I would love to maybe for you to offer me a different, a different kind of view on that, if possible, unless you agree with me. No, no, you, I, I agree that determ- the universe is deterministic, but not determinable. And actually, and I think that there is, there are consequences to your actions. I think free will is a harder thing to say. I think you do have some free will. The free the free will you have is produced by selection. That's very very complex. Yeah. But no, 
the, the, the future of the universe is not uniquely determinable, which is like batshit. Because you yeah. think about it, it's like, what? So this is the way you have to think about it. Right. Um, you, the, if your version of the universe is correct, I think what you're describing is what some people would call the block universe. And the block universe is this universe that basically time is a coordinate like in space and you can just move around that coordinate and, you know, you could go to your birth, go to your death, and they all, you, there's nothing that's happening. You just go boom, 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 that's between. And, 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 and that actually is not what reality does, right? It's actually not possible to go to your birth and go no. to your death. No. Right? Your birth has happened. Right. There's evidence of that. You're here. Right. Um, and your death hasn't yet happened. Yeah. And your death will happen if we, right. if we, you know, it, it, presumably unless you extend your life in some way. Right. So, so what that means is that there is a thing called the present, and the present really exists. And this is what physics can't cope with. Now, the real, the, but this is the other kind of really confounding thing. As I told you earlier about how hard life is, and the existence thing is probably one of the most hard things to grasp. Similar to the elements of quantum mechanics, because human minds are not built to understand quantum mechanics. This is a similar important thing. So let me just talk, talk you through this very carefully. Imagine that you're in a universe, you're in your universe, and, yeah. and, you're, able, and you're basically, I don't know, about to make a decision. Yeah. And let's just say you just stop the universe, pause. What you can do is you've got the universe now, and you say, right, I want to, is everything in my universe that's paused? And of course, you can't do this, right? It's not allowed, but let's just imagine it's allowed for a second. Yeah. Pause your universe and say, can I account for everything in the universe by what's happened before? And the answer is yes. Everything's consistent with predeterminism, laws of physics, blah, 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 blah. There's nothing novel there. You're like, okay, well, can I predict what's going to happen next? And the thing is, you can't. And the reason is because you've got the universe now inflates in, in states, in, in time. So there's now vastly more states in T plus one than was in T. In T. Right. So now how do you move from, and now how do you do a correspondence between one state and many states? How do you choose? Well, in some, some regard, there is, a, there is a correlation because there's causation. But mm -hmm. there are conditions where the contingency is erased by con just uh, contradictory interactions so when you have those contradictory interactions they actually remove the memory of the past in some cases and when you remove the memory of the past there is no way to control the future and so there is this interplay between determinism and erased determinism the hop backwards and forward which probably well not probably it does explain the universe mm -hmm. um, uh, the way the universe works and that and that is being really captured by a lot of important, well, not important, not important, a lot of interesting people. So yeah. Dan Dennett has a very good take on this. Lee Smolin has a good take on this. I have a fairly unique take on this. Yeah. And um, the reason why I am confident that I will be able to prove this with an experiment is I think of this thing called novelty, which is confusing everyone right now in generative AI. And let's just say I train an AI to yep. read, I don't know, some James Joyce or sure. some Shakespeare. Okay. That AI is not going to be able to produce anything truly novel from those books. It will look novel to people who haven't read them. Well, are we talking? Okay. Well, so this is kind of my world a little bit with software. I'm not, I don't write software, but so is this, so are you just simple algorithm learning how to do, we're not talking about neural nets. We're not talking about any of that. We're just no, neural net. You can do deep learning. Use any algorithm you want. All algorithms are equal in my book. I'm just saying, James okay. Joyce, you can do whatever you want to it. Deep deep learning, yeah. heuristic, whatever. Okay. But the thing is, yeah. those words are fixed in that book, in those locations. You right. can fool yourself mm -hmm. to think that it's, gener it's, it's generating new content. Sure. But if I take my James Joyce book, Put it through yeah. a neural net and and write more books. Right, they're James Joyce. Yeah, and you can pretend they're another author, but you didn't do it. Yeah, and that and and so and that really is like um, anti. Lots of AI people say no, that's not correct. Da, 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 you don't understand it, but they because they don't understand how the universe generates novelty. Right. Now let's take James Joyce and generate novelty. 
how do we do that? So I got James Joyce. I've done some deep learning on it. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to basically expand the universe of James Joyce, and I'm going to lose some of the correlation, and I'm going to basically take some of the causation from the environment, randomness. Interesting. And that ran true randomness. Now, the way we do that in generative AI is we take a rat, we do it randomly as well. I don't want to say, hey, randomness in here. And it's, but there's something special about the randomness in the real world versus the randomness in a, in a pseudo random number generator that you've got it's on your CPU. Random. It's not random in that number generator. It's confined to a box. In the it real world, random. chaos theory can do its thing. So, yeah. So, the, well, chaos theory just really is assembly theory with contingency. Because there, there is no, the chaos theory is a, I was fascinated with chaos theory when I was a kid, because yeah. it's like it's chaos theory is a, chaos theory is a bit like assembly theory, but actually chaos theory just says, hey, I, I lose my memory occasionally, and then I'm basically, I'm not predictable. So so, so, so that's kind of what happens. Sure. Um, and so the universe is expanding in time. There's more states made than you can get into deterministically. So you have to make a compromise. You have to take a choice. Yeah. And in that space, there's novelty. And okay. that's why the universe keeps generating it. And it's confusing the hell out of humans. Yeah. One, so when you explain this on another podcast, you should use the DALI example. Because everyone's excited about what DALI turns out. But it's simply just an amalgamate. It's an aggregate of all the images that humans have created. So yeah. it's, it's not even an AI giving us their take. It's just our take. But so, yeah, fast. Exactly. Exactly. And the stable, what the stable diffusion does is it gives us a very nice aesthetic for saying, well, I'm, I, the way I sample my space using this, it just gives me objects that really I resonate with very well. And so and it's quite nice because it gets around this kind of creepy, you know, some AIs work. But yeah, AI, GPT-3, yeah. GPT-4, all these things are not intrinsically generating novelty. And what I have to do in my lab yeah. is I'm trying to figure out experiments that prove that the, the that this kind of determinism inflation it occurs in the universe and it's quite hard but i don't think it's beyond experimental um design mm -hmm. i think we will be able to prove that time really exists and mm -hmm. it's not the measurement of things happening like a planet dying me dying the week ending i know exactly yeah yeah that time is really a thing that's wired into the universe and time is the thing that generates is the mechanism that gives us novelty yeah to move throughout time though that's another that's another chat and and something that probably can't happen we definitely can't go back in time future maybe but then again like you said it's not yeah, that's well, you're going for, you're going forward. There's, there's no there's no option. There's no you can't go back in time. I mean, the, the fact that physics, the physicists can entertain this, shows that there is a fundamental misunderstanding with the with the how the universe is constructed. Right. And it's like you know, as a chemist, I'm not allowed to turn lead into gold randomly. Right. Um, and we really shouldn't allow physicists to pretend they can go back in time <laughs> yeah. because the mathematics says so. It's wrong. Right. And that, mean, that means the way we understand our rea reality and we label the states is incorrect. And, you know, uh, and, um, and I know people don't like it, but science fiction is supposed to be science fiction. Right. You know, the, the two, I mean, I, you cannot go faster than light and no. you can't go back in time. Right. And I'm sorry that people want to tell me I'm wrong and it's possible, but they're not correct. Right. Yeah. And you can prove it. Yeah. People, people say... The interaction between two photons through quantum entanglement is faster than light, but that's not right. That's the body. They're talking we're, we're, physics-wise. The body itself needs to be going. So, so, so we shouldn't think about that because that's, that's the, the argument. Like, the fastest is what I'm saying. Yeah, the, the, it's a faster light. So what we we see is that the speed of light is about the speed of causation in the universe, and the fact is. That light light speed isn't even a speed really. It isn't. You can measure its speed, but all it says in this universe, causation can't propagate any faster than this. And some universes exist elsewhere. Their speed, their relative speed of causation, may be faster, right? Because the fundamental constants is different. But the thing is, yeah, they're not. It doesn't matter, right? That those two universes can't interact. Right. You cannot have two universes where light travels at different speeds in the vacuum, mm -hmm. right? 
Uh, you can do it through medium and so on, through you know uh, internal reflections and so on. But yeah, the, the, that is just a another. It's when people who trust the mathematics lose their intuition, right. and logic is a good thing to have to abandon your intuition to get to interesting places where your intuition pre prevents you. But yeah. when you use mathematics to raise your intuition, you start right. doing absurd things. Yeah, and it's it's funny because we're we're saying can't and we're just so concrete on this but at t equals zero all of this doesn't even matter it all breaks down and well, how can we know that t equals zero is not going to be is not going to happen again at some point i don't don't think there is ever a t equals zero all t equals zero was is when the universe lost all memory of its past oh my <laughs> lord <laughs> okay that was that you should just tweet that right now tweet it okay got it continue go ahead yeah so that's where big big bangs happen when Yep. So when, when the universe basically can't remember what's happened in the past, it just big, it's big bang. Sure. Uh, okay. Interesting. Got it. And then you you mentioned somewhere I forget um, that you thought possibly dark matter was time. You needed you need to dive into that. No, not dark matter, dark energy. Dark energy. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I, I, that idea. It's definitely uniform throughout the. Yeah, it's definitely uniform throughout the universe. Well, I, I mean, I so. Um, I need to think. I, I've been trying to think about this more carefully. But if the what we've got to try and do is, if the universe is expanding in time, yeah, um, and then then there's a case of probably saying that the energy of the universe is increasing because space has a you know empty space has associated potential energy with it. Yeah, and then and so it'd be reasonable to say, well, um, actually, uh, there is the, the this process. That exists in the universe just is is equivalent to energy increasing. It's not even at free lunch, but basically, when you look back in time, look at the structure of the universe. That miss that time is manifested in dark energy. So, what am I saying? That the miscalculations of the observation of dark energy is not dark energy. It's just how time we look at we see the, time, the evidence of time. It is a concrete um, um, proof um, residue, if you like. Mm -hmm. of the universe expanding in time okay sounds good okay got it um let's we're not we're not completely running out of time but let's dive into the twitter questions we have two um one is from who's on twitter and they ask um can you guys chat about any application with assembly theory to measure machine learning or slash ai algorithms and um, what if we can compare autoencoder metrics to assembly? Yeah, that's good. It's a really good question. Um, I was talking to Sarah Walker about this the other day, actually. Oh, wow. um, what we were trying to do is work out if we can use if we can use assembly theoretic approaches to work out when AIs are really becoming conscious oh, or no. generating novelty, right? Nice. So you've got two. So I think that we'll be able to show using assembly theory. That AIs aren't generating new novelty, but that doesn't mean in the future we won't actually generate genuinely novel novelty generating systems. We'll right. have to use a different way of doing that because novelty it's not the it, generation novelty isn't magic. It happens in the universe, right? There is creativity, but we just don't know the mechanism yet. In the same way we don't really know the mechanism gives rise to evolution. So yeah, we've been thinking about that and that's that's quite an important thing to do. The other thing is we're trying to take um we're thinking about neural networks and saying, if we can give neural networks a little bit more memory built in, understanding contingency on these graphs, then I wonder if we can build a different type of AI system that is graph-based, a bit like uh, how you could manifest, uh, is graph-based, um, and there are weightings that you can change. Yeah. Um, but what you can do is perhaps um, radically reduce the amount of energy and time you need to solve neural network problems using a more structured approach okay got it they're, they're the two things that we're thinking about with assembly theory and ai at the moment but i do think it's kind of cool like to have a have a you know a a, 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 a skynet detector using assembly theory mm -hmm. yeah right yeah that would be more than cool that'd be like very important um and it just brings me to the, like we talked about the complexity of life and AI and what you're doing. And it's just, it just occurred to me that like, 
the brain itself is AI is is not artificial, but it's it's intelligence in the fact that it's an algorithm. And at some point, do you think we'll get to the point where we AI does think for itself truly, truly, truly think for this is thrown a lot, this is thrown around a lot, but truly thinking for themselves and for the audience, I mean literally as much as free will as a person, I guess. So and if we do that, do we need to completely map out the neural synapses of the brain or can we get by with something less? Well, big question. I, I have a I have a fundamental problem calling the brain an AI and I'll tell you why for a second. Okay. The, the brain yeah. works in is a physical thing. Right. It's been invented by I know, four billion years of evolution. So there's a lot of contingency in there. Yeah. My brain is like a five-dimensional organ, isn't it? It, it's, it has a lineage going back to Luca, all the way out, so that's dimension one. It has dimensions in space, so there's four. Mm -hmm. well, Six-dimensional, has a dimension in time where it grew, you know, from my birth to now. Sure. And then, and then actually it's operating in time. So I have at least a six-dimensional brain, as do you. So when you think about those dimensions, you can't, because most people just think your brain is four-dimensional and they take it for granted that you're, you've gone through this developmental stuff, but your developmental stuff actually layers down the way you think and process information. And so when people say the brain's just an algorithm, I'm saying, well, what is an algorithm? And the thing is an algorithm, the brain is able to generate abstractions that we can teach to other brains. And those abstractions exist physically in our brains, the concept of addition, multiplication, state machines, and so on. But that doesn't, that's a model that we make to conveniently educate each other about ideas. Just because we generate those mental models doesn't mean the brain is those models. And what we do again and again and again is we confuse our, our kind of model of reality with reality. And that, I think, is a fundamental mistake in AI. Okay. Materials are not algorithms. Materials are materials. I was growing by evolution in a six-dimensional way. I, I'm not an algorithm. I never will be an algorithm. Interesting. Algorithms have special properties that we have forced into silicon and computer code. Okay. It cannot happen the other way around. And that, that's probably why everyone's got their knickers in a twist. I Yeah, no, I don't have my knickers in a twist. I definitely just... So I am thinking of the um, the fact of an algorithm on the the really most fundamental meaning of the word, not something that is programmable or programmed. I'm saying like life itself made me to do X Y Z when given X Y Z or A B C for my environment, and but that I changed that, and I didn't build that, and that was built by life. So that's when that's when I say, yeah, yeah. But I think that's a misuse of the word algorithm. That's not well posed. Algorithm has to have a precise mapping. Sure. What you're doing there doesn't have a precise mapping, and therefore can't be Turing complete. Okay. Life is not Turing complete. Okay. Therefore, this is what I think a lot of people have a problem with. They think life is Turing complete. It's not. It can't be. Okay. If, because evolution in time creates additional products. So it's yeah. not recursively innumerable. Right. And so it's it's a bit like you're always chasing your tail. It's the same reason why we can't be living in a simulation. Right. Um, because the, you, you, it, there's, there's constantly novelty being generated. I know what you mean. It feels like an algorithm. I like the kind of that I've got this situational where and these things will happen. Yeah. But it's not, a, it, it, it's, it's not correct to call it that, I don't think. And it falls down when, you're, when you look at the category, category theory in computer science. And mathematics and the mappings it just fails sure 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 okay all right this this is great because it goes into the next uh twitter question is um definitely going into this, this space so let's uh here's one what delineates something being created naturally versus synth synthetically if it is technically all arising from the processes of nature is that just a human slash cultural concept yeah i think so but I think that if you talk about naturally versus synthetically, I guess the natural one, the lineage is shorter than the, the synthetic one. So the lineage of the natural one, naturally occurring, and the synthetic one, there is some additional stuff happening. So I think that you can put it on a scale. And because in the way, when you talk about in the origin of life, um, um, 
going way back, there used to be this theory of origin, like called spontaneous generation, that life would just spontaneously generate, you know, and uh, people found that that wasn't life spontaneously generating. There were, you know, there were little, you know, um, uh, larvae and things there when maggots are coming from and, you know, embryos and all this stuff. But actually, on a long enough time scale, of course, life spontaneously generated on Earth. It had to. And so we just don't know why. And so the, the 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 ludicrousness of that kind of debunking of life being spontaneous product of spontaneous generation was a matter of time scale. So the natural to synthetic is time scale evolution and probably a little bit of abstraction because I mean synthetic requires people to think and maybe synthetic things are, you know, more more technologically constructed. Awesome. So let's, I think we're at the end. Let's let, let the people know what you're working on and what's kind of capturing your mind share at the moment. Uh, last few days, I'm trying to work out actually the, the it, what the physics of imagination are, because I can actually see some parallels between imagination, physics, time, and the origin of life, weirdly enough. But the main stuff I'm working on right now is, you know, continuing to get hard data, experimental data in the lab and measuring the assembly um change of assembly in complex chemical systems that's happening right now building detectors and also evaluating detection systems that we can send on spacecraft to go and find life forms in the solar system so nasa gets a better or an ESA and whoever um building i'm building or designing chemical brains that are that brains we're going to make out of re interacting chemicals to see if we can force such state machines on them force algorithms on them and ask them what on earth they're doing and then I think that the other thing is I'm trying to use uh, computation for drug discovery, which seems to work. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, awesome. Well, we're looking forward to hearing, or at least I am, hearing more about that in the future. Drug discovery is a huge thing that we have probably a lot more to innovate on. So that's actually pretty exciting. Um, awesome.